in the long run, there can be no joy for anybody until there is joy finally for us all. When large numbers of people share their joy in common, the happiness of each is greater because each adds fuel to the other's flame. Joy is prayer. Joy is strength. Joy is love. Joy is a net of love that draws people in. Joy is the simplest form of gratitude. The best way to show our gratitude to God and the people is to accept everything with joy. A joyful heart is the inevitable result of a heart burning with love. Never let anything so fill you with sorrow as to make you forget the joy of the Christ risen. Good morning. My name is Evan. I'm the teaching pastor here at First Temple. If I haven't met you yet, I'd love to meet you. I'll be out there at the connection point right through these doors. Come say hi. And if you are a guest, we have a gift for you. We'd love to meet you. Come say hi. We begin this new series called Made for Joy. And you may be thinking, this is poor timing. (laughs) I don't feel very joyful. I don't want to feel very joyful. I'm happy in my state of grumpiness. I understand. We are going to enter into this series together in the book of Philippians. And I pray that as we study together and look at the scriptures, we will discover the power of God's joy, which is given to us and is bigger than our circumstances. I want to begin uh, by talking a little bit about projects. Maybe you know someone, maybe you are someone that has a difficulty finishing a project that you started from time to time. This is not the time to elbow a spouse or somebody next to you, okay? I'm watching. But maybe you sometimes struggle, you start a project and you don't finish it. That used to be something that was more common in my life. And then when we had our daughter, I became a little bit more motivated to get some stuff done. At the beginning of the pandemic, we ordered a a playground set like everybody in the universe at this time because we were trying to parent and work from home and any distraction was a welcome one. So we got this uh, playground set and we had been telling her about this playground set and she was so excited about the playground set and then it arrived in a box that was like very flat and this big and I knew that it was going to be a project. And I knew as she waited and hoped and hoped that I had to get this project done. I had to show my little girl that I would finish what I said that I would do for her. And I really put a lot of value in her confidence that I will get things done and fix her problems. Now, there will be a day when I fail at that and fail plenty. But for now, I am doing my best to fix the problem so much that she has confidence that I will fix the problems, even when the dog bites one of those plastic balls and it explodes and she says, it's okay, daddy will fix it. (laughs) Luckily, I know where the store is and they have more and she'll never know. (laughs) Paul is writing in the book of Philippi to a people that he loves deeply, but the joy that he has for them does not just bubble forth because he is affectionate about them because they've had a good time hanging out before He writes to them with deep joy. And I believe what he shows us is that we can live with love and with joy because the God that we serve is a God who always finishes his projects. The God that we serve always completes what he starts so we can live with joy in the midst of difficult times, in the midst of stress, I don't know what you're carrying with you today. New school year is about to start. Maybe you are stressed about that. Maybe you work in our medical field right now and you are stressed. Maybe there has been loss in your life or challenge in your life. I hear you. But even in the midst of all those things, we can live with joy because we follow a God who always finishes the things that he begins. 
So turn with me in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1. It'll be on the screens as well. It's in the church app. It'll be on the screens if you're watching online too. Thank you for joining us online. This is Philippians 1, verses 1 through 6. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with bishops and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ I thank my God every time I remember you, constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you. Because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now, I am confident in this, that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ, the day that Christ returns. Paul is writing to this church in Philippi, and you can sense this sense of joy he has. Why? Where does it come from? The city of Philippi was a really interesting city. It was a crossroads of trade and commerce and diversity. It had been multiple cities that had been taken over and destroyed, and the Greeks rebuilt it. Alexander the Great's father, Philip, rebuilt the city. That's why it's called Philippi. It then became a Roman city, and more and more influential people found Philippi as the place to be. They would come and stay there. It was a place of wealth and influence and people who really didn't seem to have a lot of problems in the world standards. It's not a place where we would have thought a Christian church would have flourished. In fact, we know that when Paul first visited this city, there was not even a Jewish population that was already worshiping God there. Usually he would show up and go to the synagogue and meet with the Jewish believers first and talk to them about Jesus, and then the church would grow from there. But that wasn't even happening in Philippi. I want to read from Acts chapter 16, verses 11 through 15, where we hear about the beginning of this church. It says this, we set sail from Trous and took a straight course to Samothrace the following day to Neapolis and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city in the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city for some days and on the Sabbath day, we went outside to the gate by the river where we supposed there was a place of prayer. We sat down and we spoke to the women who had gathered there. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city of Thyatira and a dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to eagerly listen to what was said by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home. And she prevailed upon us. I love that line. She prevailed upon us. You know, when somebody's like, I made you a pie, you are going to stay and eat it. Paul is writing to this church in Philippi that has emerged out of the transformation of just this one woman and her family. He goes to the river and finds women praying there. And at this time, women had little influence in the world. And yet, it is from this just brief encounter that God begins to build something. God starts something in Philippi. And now, later, he is writing to a church that is established there. And normally when Paul writes a letter to a church, it starts with all kinds of credentials. Like maybe when you write an email to somebody and you're trying to let them know that you know what you're talking about, you'll include like your experience and your job title and any degrees that you have, right? Normally Paul does that kind of thing when he writes to Philippi. Grace and peace, I thank God when I remember you. There is no formalities. It is first name, basis, joy. This joy and commitment and connection flow all through this letter. Why? Paul says, I thank God every time I remember you. Do you have any relationships where every time you think of that person, you thank God? I don't know. (laughs) Constantly praying with joy in my prayers for all of you. Why? Because you're sharing in the gospel from the first day until now. I'm confident that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion in the day of Christ. Paul, in his prayer for these people, 
finds joy. See, I think we discover in the beginning of this letter that prayer reminds us of the joy that we have been given. You know, last week we talked about how joy and happiness are different things. Happiness is all about a reaction that we have to maybe what happens to us or what people do to us. Joy is a gift from God that we experience when we engage with God and when we serve one another. Today, I think we discover that when we pray and when we pray for others, we are reminded of that gift of joy. Paul is filled with joy because of these people that he loves who began something and he knows that God will continue to work and do more because of what God is doing among them as they share the gospel because of what God will do among them. See, Paul has confidence, not so much in the people of Philippi, but in the God that he serves. And as he prays, he is reminded of that God and the good things he is doing among them. He is filled with joy as he prays because of the transformation he has seen among them. Because of what God will do among them. And they are not a perfect church. We will see that throughout this letter. And yet, he is moved by joy. Prayer reminds us of the joy that we've been given. And so in a time that might be difficult or challenges that you might be facing or when joy seems distant, have you prayed? Are you praying not just about what you're going through, but for others? I think when we pray for other people's behalf, we are reminded of what God does. And maybe it's easier to see how God is working in someone else's life than our own. And then maybe we are reminded of what God is doing in ours. Another place in the scripture in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18, we find this uh, interesting passage, a command that Paul gives to Christians, and, and, and it may stress you out a little bit. Paul writes this, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And sometimes we read that verse and it's really encouraging, and sometimes we read that verse and we're like, you don't know what circumstances I'm in. <laughs> Maybe someone tells us that verse when we're in a difficult time. And we're like, that's not helpful right now. Thanks. <laughs> You've experienced that. But I think what's so beautiful about what is happening in his letter to the Philippians is that Paul, who calls us to rejoice and pray and give thanks, is here in the letter to the Philippians showing us what that looks like. He says, rejoice, pray, give thanks. These things seem connected together, like when we pray helps us discover how we can rejoice. When we give thanks, we are reminded what we have to be thankful for. In fact, the root word for the word we translate is joy. It's the same root word as grace and thanksgiving. They have the same root word, all three, the giving of thanks. The acceptance of grace, a gift from God, a life of rejoicing, it all emerges and erupts in a life of prayer together with God. We read this verse, and perhaps you still say, yeah, but you don't know my circumstances. We're going to discover that this letter to the church in Philippi, Paul wrote it while he was in prison. He can show us what it looks like to rejoice even when things are difficult. If I was writing a letter from when I was in prison, not that I've been in prison, or at least that shouldn't have popped on the background check. If I was writing a letter about being in prison, I think it would sound a lot like a letter I might have written as a kid in camp. The food is bad. The bed is bumpy. The company is terrible. Get me out of here. Paul's letter begins, grace, peace. I'm thankful, I'm praying for you, I'm rejoicing for you. Here at First Temple, we want to commit to be a church that prays together. When things were shutting down for COVID, we decided to do an online prayer time every day at noon, a midday prayer. It was really beautiful to be a part of that. And 
to go online and have prayer requests come in and just pray for each other as a community. We're still doing that every Tuesday at lunchtime. We invite you to participate on our Facebook page. It stays up too. Come pray, drop in prayer requests. Something happens when we pray. Something happens when we pray for one another too. When we hear the requests of the people in our community, when we take them to the Lord, when we remember what God has done in them and what God will do, when we remember what God has begun in us and we remember that God will complete it. I want to continue to read from Philippians 1, verses 7 and 8. It is right for me to think about you all because you hold me in your heart for all of you share in God's grace with me. Both in my imprisonment, see he's in prison, and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness. How I long for all of you with the compassion of Christ Jesus. So I think prayer helps us remember and rediscover the joy that has been given us. And I think that the joy that we discover in God, it overcomes the limits of happiness. Like I said before, happiness is kind of based on what happens to us and what we get from other people, but joy emerges from God alone. Joy is shown in the way that we serve others. Paul is writing about his love and his joy for these people. Because God has shown this to them as he's prayed for them. He is not just talking about being in prison, but how much he cares about them. I want to keep reading verses 9 through 11, this prayer that Paul will now give to the people. This prayer that emerges from the joy that he feels from the God who finishes what he starts. Here's what he says. This is my prayer, that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you determine what is best. So that in the day of Christ, when Christ returns, you may be pure and blameless, having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Christ Jesus for the glory and praise of God. Paul, in his prayer and in his rejoicing, feels a compassion towards his people, and out of that love, he offers this prayer. A prayer that the love they have from God would overflow in a way that they would have full knowledge and insight. I mean, that's a surprising prayer. You might not expect a prayer that they would know and be insightful because of the love that God has shown them. But see, Paul, as he rejoices, is thinking about them and in their situation and in the world around them. And he's saying, look, the world is going to be difficult. And I pray that because of your connection to God and how you rejoice with one another, you may be equipped to walk through a difficult world with insight and knowledge, to know, to love, and how to love. I love how Eugene Peterson puts it in the message translation of this prayer, verses 9 of Philippians chapter 1. It goes like this. So this is my prayer that your love will flourish, and that you will not only love much, but love well. Learn to love appropriately. You need to use your head and test your feelings so that your love is sincere and intelligent, not sentimental gush. Live a lover's life, circumspect and exemplary, a life Jesus would be proud of, bountiful in fruits from the soul, making Jesus Christ attractive to all, getting everyone involved in the glory and praise of God. Another thing that I think that happens when we are focused just on our happiness is we are focused just on our own well-being and what we want. And joy is outward focus. We receive the joy of God so we can focus and love others. And so we must love and love well. I discovered in my marriage that I like to receive love and be uh, loved in a certain way. Like I love to be told, good job, you're doing important things. I like, I like words of affirmation. 
And because that's the way that I like to be, to be experienced love, I just assumed everybody else was like that. And so I would tell my wife, great job, you're doing such an awesome job. But for her, it's about quality time, and then I would just leave. Right? That's not loving well. It's not loving with intelligence. It's loving worried about what we're used to in our own experience and not paying attention to others. Paul knows these people. He knows they need to hear this. They need to love well. When we think about engaging in our community, if the temptation is to do what we think would be best and make for the best Instagram post or thing that we, story we can tell people, when maybe they need us to love a little bit differently than that, to listen to what the needs really are, to respond in a way where maybe it's not about our happiness, but about them knowing the joy of God. This joy overcomes the limits of happiness that are self-centered and limited. One theologian says it like this, if we would be whole, we must grow increasingly adept in wetting our musings with our yearnings, our thoughts with our affections, our beliefs with our behaviors. Here at First Temple, we say we want to encounter God and grow in the ways of Christ. Do you see that? This is, is an experience. And it's also something that we learn together. It is something we believe and something that we do. Paul prays that the church in Philippi would be equipped to know the difference between what God is for and what God is against. That they would know how to engage with their world. That of an overflow of their love, they would know how to walk as Jesus would walk in our world. That is a prayer that we need today. That not just we would believe all the right things, but we would live the way Jesus calls us to right here and now. As I wrestled with this text, I asked the question to myself, I mean, why is Paul writing this specific message to these specific people? I think perhaps it's because they were worried about Paul. This minister who had planted their church and invested in them now in prison and he needed to remind them that despite his circumstances, his joy did not end. That chains won't stop joy. That prison won't stop the thing that God had begun in him. Perhaps, as the church in Philippi faces more influence from outside and challenges, perhaps they're facing hostility, perhaps things have gotten really hard Perhaps they're losing their joy. And Paul wants to remind them about how good it is. Maybe today, joy's hard. You're going through something difficult. You've lost something or someone. This call to joy is not to negate your pain or your grief. It doesn't say those things don't matter or aren't real because they are. Joy is in walking and knowing that, yes, those things are real. And the God of the universe who began something will fix everything. That there will be a day when there is no more pain or death or loss. God completes what he begins. So I thought about that in our church. It's been a difficult season. And we've had loss, and we've had challenges. And it can be hard to rejoice. But I thought about last week, and on the stage watching 11 people be baptized. I think the floor lost some paint because of all the water that got thrown around. It's awesome. Watching families come and kids outside on inflatables. Families pull into our parking lot and they're like, we've seen your church a lot, but then you had like water slides outside, so we thought we'd check it out. <laughs> and I am reminded that regardless of the difficulties of our time, God is still doing things. And the God who began something in this church and with me and began something with you and maybe is beginning something with you right now will complete it. And we are invited as people who have received joy to participate in the joy. And in a time where things are uncertain and difficult, that's scary. To jump in and show up and get to know people, we've lost a lot. Are we going to lose more? We don't know. 
Is it worth it? I grew up in a military family. We moved around every three years. And so we'd get to a new place. And while you got there and it was your year one, it might be somebody else's year two or three. And, and you'd make friends and they'd leave. And then you'd leave and you'd think, is this worth it? Is it worth it, worth it to get to know people and care about people, to invest with people? Because they might just bounce. Is it worth it? to know what's going on in someone's life and, and let them in on what's going on in mine when they just might be gone. I think that can be our temptation here, not just because we live in a military community. But as we've been through this time of shuffling and changes and difficulty and challenges and loss, we may think, I don't want to know people, to pray for people, to be close to people, to be present with people because, because what if it all comes crumbling down? The God who began something will complete it. And it is always worth it. And I've never regretted the relationships that I built in those short times when we were in different places. Just this week, I'm going to have a Zoom call with a youth minister I knew for about a year and a half and consider one of my greatest mentors. Because God can do things like he did with a woman praying behind by some water. <laughs> like he did and through a person who was persecuting believers and then met Jesus like he's done in this place and will continue to do. And so I want to challenge you this week to take this prayer, Philippians 1, 9 through 11. And the more that I thought about this text and wrestled with this text, the more I was convinced that our challenge should not be just to understand or unpack Philippians. I think what God has challenged us to do as a church is to pray it. And so I want to challenge you this week to pray Philippians 1, 9 through 11 every day. And as you pray it, I want you to target it at some people. I want you to pray this for your church staff. That love will flourish. That we will know what decisions to make. I want you to pray it for your church family. I want you to pray it for those in the community that may be far from God. We talk about reaching those far from God so they would encounter him and grow in the ways of Christ. Who, who comes to mind when you think about that? Pray this prayer for them. And I want you to pray it for yourself. That love would flourish. That we might learn to love appropriately. that we might live a life Jesus would be proud of. As we close this morning, I want to pray it over you, and I pray that you may discover how regardless of what you're going through, joy can still erupt. Let's pray. Church, this is my prayer, that your love will flourish, and that you will not only love much, but well. That you might learn to love appropriately, that you will need to use your head to test your feelings so that your love is sincere and intelligent, not sentimental gush. Live a lover's life, circumspect and exemplary, a life Jesus will be proud of, bountiful in fruits from the soul, making Jesus Christ attractive to all, getting everyone involved in the glory and praise of God. Lord, hear our prayer. Amen.